Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to this week's episode of the Weekly Market Review. This is for the week of the 21st of August. My name is Benjamin Goh, the Head of Research and Investor Education here at CIAS. And with me today is our Senior Technical Analyst, uh, Sunny So. So as usual, we've got a couple of um, things we want to talk about uh, for what's happening for last week. Uh, first up is, of course, the disclaimer. So uh, as you know, CIAS is a registered charity. So what we talk about today is uh, cannot be misconstrued as a recommendation. Uh, we are not licensed by MAS. Uh, so uh, before you take any kind of action in the capital markets, do see a licensed financial professional. Couple of announcements. The upcoming RCR session uh, for the month of September is going to be held on the 13th of September. This is an evening, 7 p.m. Uh, this is exclusive for uh, CS members. Do use the QR code to drop your seats. Um, do give us a five-star rating on a Google review. If you do like us, again, uh, for your convenience, here is the QR code. And the last one is that if you're not uh, right now a CIAS uh, member, then you might want to consider signing up. The membership is going for $1 per month or $12 uh, per year. So I think one of the main benefits of joining as a CIAS member is basically to participate in our exclusive uh, monthly ASEAN session. Again, the QR code is right here. So I just want to talk about the uh, main risks for last week. As you probably already know, uh, global markets were in a risk of uh, sentiment last week. Um, uh, really because of, uh, you know, China. China is a key uh, risk factor has, that has emerged in the last uh, week and a half or so. Uh, so two main problems with China. One is, of course, uh, we all know about the property sector in China has not been doing well for quite a long time. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, that was really because of, uh, you know, kicked off by China Evergrande. Uh, now we have got another company called Country Garden. Country Garden is again one of the top or biggest uh, property uh, developer in uh, China. Um, so it's a bit of a shock that the uh, news came out that uh, China, uh, the Country Garden is also in a bit of a problem, uh, financially speaking, uh, and is aging towards bond default. Now the reason is because uh, they had to pay a coupon payments for a bond uh, last week, uh, I think it was last week, uh, and they have not done so. So they are now into the 30 days uh, grace period. Uh, so all eyes on whether or not they are able to pay up their uh, you know, coupon pay payments within these 30 days. Uh. So if they cannot do that, then obviously they are technically in default uh, and then the liquidate or the, um, I guess the creditors uh, may want to convene some kind of um, meeting to get an agreement with Country Garden to uh, you know, work towards like, some kind of installment plan. So if that doesn't work out, then obviously the creditors can always uh, you know, look onto the courts for, for uh, recourse. So the whole challenge here is that Country Garden has always been seen as kind of the more stable or the stronger um, you know, probably developer uh, as opposed to China Evergrande, uh, but that has proven to be uh, not true. Uh. So this feeds into the narrative that the uh, real estate problems in China still has not been fixed. Uh, and then uh, the question here is, of course, if companies um, like China Evergrande and Country Garden can be in trouble, then what about the less uh, strong property developers out there? So that's one. Uh, two is, of course, uh, Zhongzi. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Zhongzi Enterprises. Uh, is basically a financial company that sells uh, trust products. So, um, you know, we call them shadow banking uh, entities. The reason is because they are not really banks. Uh, they are not really uh, asset managers. But what they do is, of course, they collect uh, investors' money and then they sell a trust product. Uh, so in China, uh, if you don't already know, Chinese citizens can't actually invest outside the country. So they can, you know, put money in the savings account in a bank or they can buy property as investments, or they can buy the sell of homegrown domestic uh, trust products. And actually on paper, this kind of trust products are actually quite uh, attractive because the yields can be about 67%. Uh, and because it's a trust product, it's something like a fixed deposit. So the idea here is that the risk is uh, non-existent and then you get 67% uh, without having to uh, you know, uh, invest in the stock market. So there's very little risk. Uh, that was a whole narrative uh, beforehand. Uh, and that's why, you know, a lot of people bought into these uh, products, not just from Zongzi, but also from a lot of other companies that sell these uh, products. Uh, so the sad fact is that uh, Zongzi actually took a lot of the investors' money and it invested right back into uh, the property market. So what they did was to, uh, you know, take investors' money and then to issue out as loans 
to uh, probably developers. And of course, if the probably developers are running into trouble, like Country Garden and uh, the rest of the sector, uh, then uh, Song Tzu will have problems collecting money back and of course to uh, you know uh, reimburse or to provide a yield that his customers are demanding. So it's not just the yield that's foregone, but also the entire principal sum. So again, there's some news feed out there that uh, you know, people are not happy. They are taking to the streets, so they are basically going to the Jones' office to complain, uh, so and so forth. And uh, you know, again, that brings or feeds into a narrative that the uh, you know, financial sector, uh, in the in China, uh, because it is so uh tightly um, I guess tied to the property sector. So if the property sector is running into trouble, then of course companies or banks that lend money to the property sector are also running into trouble. So the whole narrative here is that the confidence in China's economic outlook is actually dwindling quite quickly. Um, the government has not come up with any kind of huge stimulus packages. So a lot of talk, uh, you know, promises of support. Uh, but uh, it looks as though the company, or rather the uh, government, is staying away from the uh, big stimulus packages to build this, uh, to bail these companies out as well as the sectors out. Uh. So uh, confidence is running low. Uh, already we have got, again, other pieces of information that shows a lot of the foreign fund managers have exited China or exiting China. Um, so this includes uh, the long only as well as the hedge funds, um, you know, hence the stock market is down. Uh. So this is the chart behind. We have got the um, MSCI World Index, which is the blue color line. So it's down almost about, uh, I guess, 4.8%, almost 5%, um, you know, uh, as of last week, Friday. Uh, so if you compare that World Index versus the MSCI World Index, but specifically with only China exposure, which is the white color line, uh, that is down at about 9-ish, uh, 10% uh, if you compare it versus uh, two months ago. Now. Okay. Um, the Hang Seng Index, which is the Hong Kong um, stock index, uh, officially entered a bear market uh, as of uh, last week, Friday. Uh, what that means is that uh, it's down by about uh, or more than 20%. So that's classified as a uh, bear market. Mm. Okay, so uh, Hang Seng, Hong Kong, as well as China, not doing well simply because of uh, all these problems here. So um, now let's talk about the GDP front, not just the financials or the capital markets. So the GDP slowdown in China is absolutely uh, real. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, China has had high GDP growth for a long time. Uh, the uh, MS, or rather the Morgan Stanley, the investment bank, has lowered China's GDP forecast to 4.7% from 5%. This is for full year 2023. And uh, lowered also the 2024 forecast uh, to 4.2 percent from 4.5 percent. So two takeaways. So five percent is actually um, down really because previously um, at the beginning of the year we we're talking about 5.5 percent, uh, and uh, now it's five percent but lowered down to 4.7 percent. Now this is again one opinion from uh, you know one bank. So other banks have different opinions. Um, the second thing is that, of course, 5% for any other country except for China would be great. I mean, Singapore having 5% per year GDP growth is great. Uh, for the US, of course, uh, would be great as well. The challenge is, of course, that in China, 5% is seen as not good. Uh, if you talk to business people or you know, tech executives or ordinary people, uh, when you tell them 5% GDP is good, they will tell you that 5% feels as though it's already uh, in a recession, simply because things are not moving as fast as uh, you know previously. So don't just look at the on paper, the number, but also if you talk to your friends so and so forth, uh, based in China, uh, they might tell you some uh, real life stories about what's happening there. Now. All right, so uh, don't think that 5% is great. Uh, you know, it's, For China, it is actually just treading water. If you look at some of the international companies, uh, big um, conglomerates as well as companies, uh, you know, building um, you know, heavy industries like Caterpillar, and of course Dupont is of course uh, sells a lot of chemicals, uh, raw materials for a manufacturing process. So these companies, uh, let's say in the U.S., uh, they are just two anecdotes, two data points out of a long list of firms that in the last uh, earnings season uh, cycle have sounded uh, a little bit of alarm at uh, what's been happening in China. All right, so these companies sell globally. And of course, um, the, um, you know, China is one of the biggest uh, consumers of their products. 
So at the earnings season, uh, you know, conference calls, if they say that, you know, they are having some issues with China, you know, revenue is down, so and so forth. That again is a reflection of the challenges facing the uh, Chinese uh, economy. So that's uh, no good. Um, now let's talk about some of the companies or the sectors that have got high exposure to China. Uh, so um, for the last, um, I guess a few months ago, maybe the last two or three months ago, uh, luxury brands were flying high in China simply because they were riding on the post-pandemic uh, post opening. Uh, so uh, at one point, um, LVMH, uh, the, or the owner of LVMH, became one of the richest men uh, you know, in the world simply because of the surging stock price of LVMH uh, and really on the back of the uh, you know, superior performance in sales in China. Uh, so this is basically a laundry list of the six I guess, um, biggest brands uh, with exposure in China. So if you look at LVMH all the way to uh, Swatch or uh, Moncler. So Swatch has got a huge um, you know, exposure to China, about 35%. And we're talking about revenue exposure, right? So they get about one third of the revenue out of China. LVMH is about 70%, so and so forth. Uh, if you look at the year-to-date performance, uh, this is the stock price. And we're talking about uh, comparing from the 2nd of January until now. Um, Herms, of course, is still up 30%, but uh, if you look at all these six companies combined since the start of August until Friday last week, which is only, I think it was the 18th of August, not even the end of the month, uh, this the six companies have lost a combined market cap of $86 billion US dollars. So as you can see, although the year-to-day performance is still high, but they've been losing a lot of ground, uh, in the last uh, two to three weeks. <clears throat> so this is not great. So again, it points to the fact that, or rather it feeds a narrative that, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, economy is really not good. It's not just the middle class, but this is all the, um, I guess, the upper middle class and the, um, you know, the, uh, the rich people who are not really spending so much, right? So uh, not good at all. And this is only uh, the, today is, uh, you know, I think it's the 20th of August, 21st of August. So we still have got uh, slightly more than a week to go. Now, next up is, of course, the semiconductor exposure to China. Uh, again, a laundry list of some of the biggest players in the tech sector. Um, and we're talking about mostly hardware here. <clears throat> so NVIDIA, as you know, is the global leader for uh, GPUs, graphics processing units, which are used in, uh, of course, games, but uh, mostly in enterprise uh, servers that do um, AI-related work. Uh, so things like um, uh, you know, computer vision, things like uh, classification uh, problems, so and so forth. Uh, I, and I really didn't know this, but uh, you know, Morgan Stanley has come up with a table here that shows already worked out that about 45% of NVIDIA's revenue actually comes from uh, China. Um, I guess they did quite a lot of analysis on this. Uh, Marvel Technology, again, 42%, Silicon Labs, 40%, AMD is 39%, Qualcomm, of course, is a global leader. Uh, they sell uh, designs for you know, computer chips, uh, the ones that also go into your uh, phones. Uh, so that's about 35% for Qualcomm and so on and so forth. Now, as you can see, <clears throat> This is, uh, I guess, on hindsight, not uh, surprising, uh, simply because China is the world factory. So although they may not own the technology, but a lot of the um, manufacturing is done in China. Um, so uh, TSMC is, of course, a global leader. Uh, but then, uh, you know, they are in, uh, they, you know, they, they have factories all over, all over, so on and so forth. Um, but as you can see, this is uh, a huge problem for companies on this list. Uh. The stock price of NVIDIA uh, and uh, AMD so and so forth is still relatively high. NVIDIA is, of course, very frothy, very rich. It's now about $400 plus US dollar. Uh, but a lot of it is not so much driven by the uh, sales or earnings. So if you look at the P ratios or price of sales, uh, ratios for these companies they are actually quite high compared to historical norms and compared to uh, industry norms. But really is because of the AI craze. So remember the AI craze was uh, kicked off last year in October, somewhere in October, that's when the news came up that Microsoft was investing 10 billion US dollars into OpenAI. OpenAI is the company that came up with ChatGPT. And from then on, all these companies um, you know, anything that they, uh, they're related to AI, if they say they're doing AI, stock price went berserk. So if you look at NVIDIA, 
stock price is relatively high, but uh, one of the key concerns is that it's not really driven by the sales or earnings, uh, which is good, but P ratios and PS ratios are quite high, but it's really because of the news feed and because of the whole focus on the AI craze. Um, but, uh, you know, these companies really need to justify their high, relatively high stock price by having better earnings uh, in the next uh, two quarters or so, or else people will start to, um, you know, take profit simply because the financials or the performance is uh, not there. All right, so with that, I'm going to hand over the time to Sunny, who will be talking about the technicals for last week as well as the week going forward. Thanks, Ben. So let's look at some of the macroeconomic data last week. On Tuesday, 15 August, we have the retail sales number, which was a very positive number coming at 0.7% which was higher than the previous month reading of 0.3% and above market consensus of 0.4%. So this put a lot of pressure on the Fed to increase the interest rate further for next month's September meeting. The building permit also came in slightly positive from previous month reading, but was below the market consensus. But the main trigger for the decline of last week's major US indices was the FOMC meeting minutes, which indicates that more Fed officials are looking to increase interest rate further for the rest of the year. On the corporate earnings calendar, next week, Wednesday, we will be looking at NVIDIA reporting their corporate earnings with the EPS consensus at $2.07 and the revenue forecasted at around $11 billion. Now, this will be very closely watched as it's a big component of some of the major indices and a big tech stock, which could direct the where the NASDAQ Composite Index may be going. On the CME Fed Watch tool, which calculates the probability of the next Fed rate high, you can see that the latest probability reading is at 89% but the previous week reading was at 90%. So just a 1% change in the probability that we will see no rate increase in the 20th September reading. But as we get closer to next month, 20th September, this probability might change. So for now, I believe that market has not really priced in that we will see a rate hike next month and still holding on to see that we will be having a unchanged kind of a reading for the Fed Fund target rate in September. Next, let's look at the charts. The Dow Jones Index closed at 34,500 last Friday, up 25 points. It closed above a major uptrend line connecting the low of October as well as the low of March. And this is also a point previously in the first half of this year, which formed a triple top resistance level. And this could be a good support for the Dow Jones Index. However, the MACD indicator is still negative, and the RSI at a reading of 40 it shows that the momentum is very weak right now, and we are still 10 points away to trigger the 30-point oversold signal. So that means that for Dow Jones, probably this level around the 35,400 or 35,500 may be a pivot level for now before it starts to turn back up again. Next, the S&P 500 was slightly flat on Friday, just down 0.01% and closed at 4,369 points. It has broken below a short-term uptrend line that we see over here in green and is looking for the next support level, which will likely come in around this triple top. A resistance level previously, which could have a change in polarity around the 4,200 point level. The MACD indicator is still negative and looks to be expanding downwards. That means that this slide towards 4,200 is pretty much likely. The RSI at 34.55 is still some points away from the 30 point oversold trigger. That means that it will confirm that the slide is likely to continue. So I'm not very optimistic on the S&P 500 having a rebound soon and would likely see the 4,200 point mark soon. Uh, next week or the week after. The NASDAQ Composite Index, similar to the S&P 500, broken below a short-term uptrend line. The next support for the NASDAQ Composite Index will be the 12,269 point level because this is the level that we saw a double or triple top resistance level in the early part of this year. And this could have a change in polarity for the NASDAQ Composite Index to become a support level. The MACD indicator is negative and looks to be extending downwards further, so that means the downtrend is going to continue. The RSI at 32 is close to the oversold mark, so do look out for that. If it goes below the 30-point mark, a reversal might happen for the NASDAQ Composite Index. So that's all I have for the technical analysis for this week's weekly market review. I'll see you next week in the next weekly market review.